Uh, so today it's a great pleasure to have Chris Akers and who will tell us about multi-partite yeah, and Thank you, Sebastian, and thanks for the opportunity to talk in this amazing auditorium. Um, and hello to all the perspectives who are visiting. Uh, this is a fun time. I remember my perspective visits. I hope that you can find this a little informative, um, even if a bit jargony. Um, if you don't enjoy it, just keep in mind that this is my last year here, so don't let that affect your decision to come to Princeton. So um, this is based on work that hopefully will be coming out uh, early next week. So we've learned a lot about quantum gravity by thinking about ADS-CFT. And let me summarize ADS-CFT in the way that will be relevant for this talk. So there's two theories, anti or gravity and anti-de-sitter space and a conformal field theory. And you could picture each as I've drawn. So this is what you might think of as a time slice of the anti de gravity theory. And then, it, so it's like a, the whole disk. And then a time slice of the CFT you might as mad, imagine as the circle on the outside of the disk. And um, so the ADS gravity theory has gravity. So it's like a theory of quantum gravity in principle, whereas this CFT doesn't have gravity. So it's just a theory, uh, you know, quantum mechanical theory, quantum field theory. And what's interesting about this is that they are dual in a sense that they, they describe the exact same system, but seemingly in completely distinct ways. I mean, they seem very distinct because they use a different number of spatial dimensions. Um, and they're, so they're describing the same system. And this comes with, well, we can sort of formalize that notion by saying that there's some map that relates the states. So like one state on the ADS side is, is uh, dual to a particular state on the CFT side. By, and that relationship is, is given to you by some holographic map that we'll call V. So given some state, say, psi in the ADS gravity theory, there's some dual state that we might call psi tilde in the CFT. <laughs> and um, even though we've learned a lot by thinking about ADS CFT, our understanding of ADS CFT is still imperfect, so we'd like to understand it better. Tensor networks are the subject of this talk, and they are essentially toy models of the ADS to CFT map V. So, there's been a lot of work on them. And the reason we think about them, these toy models, is because you know, we try and build these toy models with properties that we know ADS-CFT has. And I'll mention some of those. And as we do it, we learn there's certain tensions between these different properties. And resolving these tensions, getting a model that has all of them, is very informative. So we learn more about ADS-CFT as we try and build these tensor networks. That's the motivation for them. Now, what are tensor networks? Well, there's a typical construction that goes something like this. So you imagine that you have a discretized bulk. So the bulk here is another word for the ADS space time, because it, it's called the bulk because it's not the boundary. It uses the entire uh, interior of the disk. <clears throat> so a discretized version of the ADS space might look something like this, where I've just plopped down uh, sort of a lattice. So there's, there's vertices, which are like these black dots. And there, you might imagine there's some qubit. A qubit just means some finite dimensional quantum system, some, some Hilbert space with finite dimension. And that's going to represent your matter. So you might have some like matter excitation at that point. That's represented by some non-trivial state of that qubit in this model. The other ingredient is the, are these lines. And these lines represent the geometry of ADS. And they're represented here in this toy model by an entangled pair of qubits. So, so I don't know if you can see this from where you are, but there's, say on this, this line here, there's a solid part, then a dotted part, then another solid part. The two solid parts are two qubits, so two finite dimensional quantum systems. The dotted part represents they're in some entangled state, some particular entangled state, say like some, some maximally entangled state, like a bell pair. But, uh, but something that generalizes a bell pair, it's not two two-dimensional quantum systems, it's to high dimensional quantum systems. And what it's, it's you know, technically, we need these dimensions, so these qubits and these qubits that live on the vertices, to have different dimensions for this to work very well. So we want these qubits that make up the geometry to have very large dimension relative to those. So this is Hilbert space dimension. 
Um, but that's just a technical advisor. Okay. Now that, that represents your bulk state, like your, your ADS state. And then <clears throat> remember that the holographic map was a map that gives you some state that you might imagine as existing in some Hilbert space with the spatial structure of the boundary circle. So that map here is basically you, you can consider all of these red boxes that I've drawn here. So each red box just now includes five qubits. So this red box includes, say, this qubit that was the matter dot, and then the four surrounding qubits that were part of these entangled pairs making up the geometry. So that's some Hilbert space with five factors. You pick some state and that Hilbert space with five factors. Um, there's many clever ways to do it. Different tensor networks pick different states. And then you just hit it with the bra of that state. So you know this, saying we had some state here, that was like we had a ket, then we hit many of the factors with uh, different bras. And that essentially deletes them from the state and leaves you with, with just a state on the remaining factors, these boundary ones. And this, in tensor networks, models the CFT state. So, so this was the ADS state. The tensor network was, the holographic map was this projection, this, this hitting it with the bras that mapped you to this state. That's how traditional tensor networks worked. <clears throat> now, the pro of this is that they give you a holographic entropy formula. So this is something that's very nice about ADS-CFT. And you're just going to have to believe me that it's very nice and very influential in ADS-CFT. Um, and what it looks like in tensor networks is the following. So let's say you had some bulk state, and then you used this map to get some boundary state. So you have some uh, states on all the degrees of freedom living at the boundary. We could consider some subregion, maybe the, the one, all the factors intersected by the solid blue line, call that B, and take the state on this, take the state of the boundary, uh, trace out the part that's not intersected by this blue line, so the complement of capital B. That gives you the reduced density matrix of B. Take that reduced density matrix, plug it into this formula, and that defines this quantity S, the von Neumann entropy. That's an interesting quantity in say, quantum information theory and for us. <clears throat> and what's interesting about tensor networks is that analogous to ADS-CFT, they satisfy a, this holographic entropy formula. So if you, you know, instead of doing the calculation as I said it, where you compute the reduced density matrix of B and plug it into this, you could instead compute the von Neumann entropy of B in the in the state v psi, so this is the state on the boundary, by using this formula that only refers to bulk quantities, quantities in the original bulk lattice. <clears throat> and this has two pieces and a minimization. So the, the, the important piece, the, port, the, the idea is that <clears throat> you consider all cuts through the graph that are homologous to capital B, so meaning essentially that they have the same, the, the cut, the dotted line here ends on the endpoints of B, but then it, you know, it could cut anything. You consider all possible cuts. This is one example. And associated to every cut, there's, uh, you know, the, this, this is the number of links that we cut. So here it would be three times log capital D. That's the dimension of the qubits that made up the geometry. That's one quantity, and that's morally like the area. In ADS-CFT, that, that would be like the area, like the area of some surface that you drew in the space. Um, and the other quantity you associate to such a cut is this von Neumann entropy of the region, you know, of the degrees of freedom between that cut and capital B. If you add those together, that gives you a quantity. And if you find the, minim the, minimal, the minimum of such quantities over all cuts, turns out that gives you the von Neumann entropy of this boundary region, capital B. <clears throat> Capital V here is the tensor network. Um, it's the holographic map. So, yep. This is indicating that, so psi was the bulk state. And so this is indicating that we're computing the von Neumann entropy of this region, little b. 
in that bulk state. Okay. So that's a pro. It's one reason why people like tensor networks at all. But there's a con. And I'll try and explain this con as succinctly as I can. So one reason people like ADS-CFT, well, I mean, what, what's so cool about it is that it's sort of a dynamical duality. So if you had an ADS state, and then you time evolved it for some time t, and then you mapped it to the CFT, you would have gotten the same state if you had first mapped it to the CFT and then time evolved for, for that amount of time. So you would like something like that in tensor networks. That would be very cool. But we don't have something, well, the closest we can get is defining some Hamiltonian on the bulk qubits and then pushing that through the map. So you get some Hamiltonian on the boundary, but this Hamiltonian on the boundary um, in general will not be local. And what was cool about ADS CFT was that you know, we have some local CFT, some, some CFT with a local Hamiltonian. That's why it was nice. If you have something very arbitrarily non-local, then it's not really fair to say you have some uh, nice dual theory that you understand. Okay. So long term, what we'd like is to have something like a, a tensor network toy model, but we'd like it to have time evolution, to not fall in, to not suffer from this issue. But we'd also like to keep the holographic entropy formula. And it's, it's actually those two things that are in tension. Um, so let's ask ourselves, why are tensor networks having this problem when ADS-CFT does not have this problem? Right? Because gravity works, and it, it, it seems to have the holographic entropy formula um, and this matching of time evolution. And the big difference that I think is the relevant one is that ADS is very different from the bulk Hilbert space in tensor networks. So in gravity, there are constraints that reduce the Hamiltonian to a local integral along the boundary. So what I mean by this schematic equation is that while I could write the Hamiltonian in ADS as some integral over some uh, over space, maybe with some boundary term, um, the, in, the, the part that's an integral over space, so sigma here would be like the entire disk that we drew originally, uh, that part actually vanishes when acting on any physical state by the gravitational constraints. So, you know, the thing analogous, roughly analogous to like Gauss's law in gravity, I mean, in a QED. Um, so the only physical part of the time evolution is some, some local integral along the boundary of space. So this is the only part that you actually have to match in the CFT. The part that's more volumetric, uh, it's not doing anything physical that we need to worry about CFT time evolution matching. Okay. So the fact that the, the ADS Hamiltonian can be written, the physical part is just some local Hamiltonian, sorry, some local integral along the boundary of space, leads to an easy match to a local Hamiltonian and the dual theory. So that's, that's essentially why ADS-CFT seems to have this uh, whole problem figured out. So I propose, other people have thought about this, as a step towards adding time evolution into a tensor network, we can try to incorporate a more sophisticated bulk Hilbert space with more gravity-like constraints. So, okay. Now, at first, this seems intractable because tensor networks inherently involve a discretization of space-time. You know, if, if we don't have that discretization, uh, we sort of lose analytic control. Are we even talking about tensor networks anymore? So if we're talking about tensor networks, we, we have this discretization that we talked about. But that breaks the very diffeomorphism invariance that we would like to have that seems like it's at play here in making ADS-CFT work. <clears throat> However, and this is the trick, in two plus one dimensions, there's a trick available to us, which is that we can change variables. So we're going to work in two plus one dimensions. So that's two spatial dimensions and one time dimension. And the, the change of variables is essentially given here, where e mu and omega mu are the Weilbein and spin connection. These are, these are gravity quantities. P and J are the generator of translations and the generator of um, Lorentz transformations. 
So these, what, what this right-hand side is just all quantities that you would naturally define in gravity, and we're just here packaging them into this quantity a mu, which, um, which will be a gauge field. And the point is that if you do this change of variables, transforms the action to that of um, a certain kind of gauge theory, this SL2R cross SL2R turns Simon's theory. And the idea is that in this TQFT description, discretizing space-time no longer means breaking gauge invariance. Now, for the experts, you might worry, well, isn't discretizing uh, turns Simon's a very subtle issue? And in general, that's true, but here it's a special kind where these SL2Rs have equal and opposite level k minus k, and that uh, rescues it. It seems like you don't face the same obstructions. But I actually won't be discretizing this trans Simons theory here. I'll be doing something simpler. Okay, so the idea is we could try to incorporate. I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, uh, yeah. I think if you have if you have compact trans Simons um, of this form, so it's like g cross g with equal and opposite level. I think that you can uh, straightforwardly use this like Vera Tarayev construction. The non-contact case, I understand less. Yeah. Um, okay, so, okay, so one plan of attack is we could try to incorporate this discretized TQFT into H bulk. And this seems relatively straightforward to do if you're familiar with the tensor network literature because a number of recent papers have, have done this. They've taken these traditional tensor networks I described and explained how you might add gauge fields into these tensor networks, including some work um, that I've done. However, we run into new subtleties. And the idea of the subtleties is that this TQFT describing gravity is more sophisticated than the gauge theories so far incorporated into tensor networks. So far, people mostly thought about regular lattice gauge theories satisfying you know, Gauss's law uh, only. So we're gonna need to figure out some changes to the tensor network to make it work like we want. So let me explain these subtleties. So in ADS-CFT, we have this holographic entropy formula, which I said before and I described in the context of tensor networks. In ADS-CFT, the picture is exactly analogous. So you might have some subregion, capital B of the CFT, and then you can compute its entropy using a formula like this, where you're minimizing something that the key is it involves this geometric area. So, you know, there's going to be some, some surface you find that's, you know, has some position, some particular position in the ADS spacetime. And that position, you know, this quantity associated to that surface with that position minimizes this right hand side. That's how it goes in ADS. That's how it went in tensor networks. But in the TQFT description, it's different. This A hat operator translated into the TQFT variables is a, a certain kind of Wilson line. And it cares about the gauge field it's passing through, not the metric. So in particular, if there's no matter around, and we were trying to use the TQFT description of the bulk to compute, say, the, the entropy of capital B, it would involve this Wilson line um, but the Wilson line wouldn't care if it was going here or there. This area in, in the TQFT description, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like a, it cares about the target space geometry, not this world tree geometry. The geometry that the TQFT lives on is irrelevant to this formula. So to make a tensor network model of this, we still want to have some discretized geometry, like before, with this gauge theory living on the links. But what's different now is that we want the a-hat operator to measure the gauge fields only, not the geometry. That this is abnormal from the point of view of tensor networks. So let me emphasize what we want. So again, without matter, if we, so in the case without matter, this gauge theory that we are, we're going to want to include will be topological, so some topological lattice gauge theory. And this a hat should give the same answer evaluated along any cut, maybe you know, this cut or this weird cut that cuts many more links 
And that's not something that the area operator in normal tensor networks does. So our main result, the one I want to tell you about in this talk, is to construct a tensor network with this property. So it has, so I'm going to construct a tensor network that you know, looks schematically like this, where it's going to have a bulk, some lattice like this, and have some boundary that's you know, the, the boundary degrees of freedom. And there's going to be some map between those Hilbert spaces. And it will have a holographic entropy formula that looks qualitatively identical, except the area operator is a new different kind of area operator. And it, it will in particular have a property like this that I'll explain in more detail. Yes. Uh, yes, so you mean why don't we just, I mean, it, it's sort of general covariance that mixes up time and space and you, you know, it's kind of hard to, I don't know how to construct a lattice system that, that adequately satisfies the Hamiltonian constraints and discretizes space. Maybe other people have thought about this, but. So I want to emphasize that what I said about time evolution leading up to this was really motivation for what we, well, our technical result is not that we add in time evolution to a tensor network. We, we'd like to do that. That's you know, important future work. Our technical result is that we construct a tensor network with a holographic entropy formula with this new kind of area operator. And I think that this is an important step towards getting good time evolution for the reasons I've tried to motivate. Yeah, so the, there's a particular Wilson line, like, you know, lives in a particular infinite dimensional representation and has particular Ishibashi states in the end. So this, when you evaluate this Wilson line, he gives you the area of the minimal surface. So I don't know what the TQFT version of non-minimal surfaces is. Um, so yeah, the dictionary is a little bit sophisticated in that regard. But this Wilson line gives you the area of the minimal surface. Yeah. But the minimization will, over the position will be non-trivial when there's matter, because the Wilson line then depends, you know, which gives you a different value evaluated on different sides of the matter. Like if it includes this guy or that guy. So this theory will be topological. So there will be, if there's no matter, then there's no, uh, right, there's nothing stopping you from deforming this guy to that guy and getting the same value. And I want to say, um, you know, we also built up to this point by thinking about SL2R cross SL2R turn Simons, but solving this problem, constructing a tensor network with this property, will not require the full complication of this Trent Simons theory, like trying to put it on a lattice, dealing with the fact also that it's some non-compact group. We won't need all that subtlety. So uh, we'll instead work with a much simpler topological lattice gauge theory, which has this, this same subtlety, and we can try and construct a tensor network with this property for that simpler guy. And now I'm gonna explain to you what that simpler lattice model is. <clears throat> so it's what we call it the doubly gauged model. And for those of you familiar with Kataya's quantum double model. It's essentially Kataya's quantum double model, but where projection onto the ground space is uh, enforced as a constraint. So consider a finite group G, and we're going to define a Hilbert space, like L2 of G, or I'll call it HG, where it's spanned by some orth an orthonormal basis where each basis ket is like ket G for each G in that group. So these ket Gs form an orthonormal basis for HG. <clears throat> and we're going to consider a lattice within links carrying such a Hilbert space. And we'll also allow there to be um, some of the vertices, maybe all of them, maybe 
a fraction of them, <coughs> carrying some Hilbert space that I'll call HM. So this is like the matter Hilbert space. And in this drawing, so each of these links, they have an arrow. I know it's hard to see where you are. They're, they're, it's some link that's oriented. And I've indicated the vertices that have matter by these lines that are diagonal connected to gray dots. So here I've drawn two vertices that, have, that are allowed to host matter. Could, we could have put it on all of them. For generality, I'm drawing something where some of them have it, some of them don't. And this matter could be electrically or magnetically charged. Now, we start with this Hilbert space where we've you know, taken, say, n copies of this HG, one for each link, and then m copies of this HM, the matter Hilbert space. And we construct the Hilbert space we really care about by introducing these two constraints. So I, I've drawn them here, let me explain them. This is without matter, and then I'll say how matter modifies it. So if you imagine, we zoom in, say, on one vertex. Uh, as I said, you know, each link, there's a, there's a basis for this set of links where we just assign a group element to each link. And so a general state, you would start out writing a wave function over those group elements. We're going to demand that physical wave functions, wave functions that we call physical, are those that are invariant under a certain kind of transformation. So this is a transformation where all the links attached to this vertex are, uh, have, you know, each group element is multiplied by a group element G in, in the appropriate way. So here, you know, G1 now goes to G times G1. G4 went to G4 times G inverse. The difference here, why is it inverse here and not there, had to do with the orientation of the links. So the orientation of the links informed us how we're supposed to do this gauge transformation. Th this is the standard, yeah, this is the standard thing, the standard story. And, um, okay, good, so physical states are the ones invariant under such multiplications by this group element at, at, for all links on that vertex. We're gonna add another constraint, which is, is you know, perhaps less common, so say like lattice QED does not satisfy this. Um, it's the flatness constraint. And that is, if you took a plaquette, which is one of these fundamental squares, say like this guy here, not some big square that you might build out of smaller fundamental squares, take a fundamental square. You consider the, the group elements assigned to each link, and you take their product going around a loop. That product of group elements has to give you the identity group elements. So this is, we're only gonna consider states that satisfy that property. So, so these two properties together tell us how to restrict from this naive pre-gauged Hilbert space to what we call the physical Hilbert space. The physical Hilbert space is the pre-gauged one modded out by these Gauss and flatness constraints. Good. Oh, yeah, and if you have matter, electric charge adjusts this Gauss constraint. So the electric charge, the, the, the matter gets involved with this transformation. Ditto, the matter can get involved with this flatness rule, um, say if it has magnetic charge. Now, what operators are available in this theory? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. So uh, what operators are available? So on each link, each HG, there are two basic types. So you could, this LH here, H is a group element. Remember, G is also a group element. LH acting on G here left multiplies it. So it takes you to ket H times G. This is analogous to, say, like the electric operators in a continuum. The other type that we'll consider are these Wilson operators. So W is, has these three indices, mu, I, and J. Mu is uh, indexes irreducible representations of the group, and then I and J are indices within that irrep. And the way, so the way it acts on G is it just gives you um, this value. So this D is uh, this D of G is a representation. It's the you know, muth representation of G, and I and J are are you know it's matrix indices. You don't need to re remember those details. I'm showing you that for completeness. 
What's important is that on the physical Hilbert space, no linear combination of these commutes with both Gauss and flatness on general links. You generally build gauge invariant operators out of combinations acting on different links, like Wilson lines. So this guy acting on just some link in the middle of the, the lattice will violate Gauss's law. But if you appropriately combine him with Ws on adjacent links all the way out to the boundary, well, that guy can be uh, gauge invariant. A particularly relevant kind of gauge invariant operator in this model are ribbon operators. So Wilson lines are a special case of ribbon operators here. I expect you can't see all the little indices I've written here. It's not that important, but let me explain what I'm trying to show. So, so here is a lattice with five links. So there's three links going horizontally, and then there's these two links coming up vertically. Uh, the ribbon is this blue shaded region that we call gamma, and it's oriented, so it's going from left to right. And a ribbon operator is this F subscript gamma, so that subscript tells you it's acting on this ribbon. And the ribbon operator is labeled by two group elements, H and G. And those group elements play distinct roles. So this G here is effectively, it's like doing the Wilson line part of it. So the way F acts on this state is it, uh, so the G part of it looks at the holonomy you get by traveling along this spine here. You might call this, this path at the bottom the spine of gamma, because that's where gamma is running along. And it takes the product, G1 times G2 times G3, and then it annihilates it if it's not equal to the group element G. H has a different role. It uh, acts on these two guys, that, and it shifts them. So it acts kind of like these L operators on, on uh, the two spokes here coming out of the spine. Uh, and it shifts them in a, a sort of coordinated way such that it will continue to satisfy the flatness constraint. The exact details of the ribbon aren't important. What's important is that once you have both Gauss and flatness, it's, uh, you know, in general, you can't act these electric operators like you could if you didn't have flatness, but you can act these ribbons. So these ribbons sort of, um, they need, they're gauge invariants if they sort of end at the boundary where you're not imposing Gauss or flatness. Um, and this is the way that you can say like shift things uh, with L's still in a gauge invariant way with these two constraints. Yes. So um, you could, yeah, add as many legs as you want. So if there was a leg going down here, it just wouldn't be acted on by this ribbon. This ribbon does nothing to, the, to those legs. Yeah. Yeah. You said that links are lattice for special kinds? Yes. It, if you set H equal to the identity, like little, so uh, it's a special kind where you're not shifting these spokes. It's just, well, I, make, I can make a basis of Wilson lines by setting H to the identity, and then this will give me the set of operators that asks for this holonomy to be equal to some particular group element. Yeah. 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 This is very related to braiding. Yes, so a general ribbon, I have a hard time ascribing a particular conceptual understanding. Right. So if you, yeah, so for that case, we have that understanding. There will be a particular combination of these ribbons that I'll show in the next slide that has the interpretation of measuring the net electric flux flowing through the ribbon flowing transverse through it. And that's, that's the ribbon operator that's relevant for us. It bas basically because 
normally these L's, these shift guys, <coughs> are, you know, you can use them to measure the electric flux flowing through a link. We can no longer do that in this theory because of the flatness constraint. That's not gauge invariant. But what you can do is do some sort of a integrated version of that, which you build out of these ribbons. So it's, it's essentially shifting all of them in a coordinated way. And that measures the net electric flux flowing through it. And of course, if there's matter, you can have other physical operators, which in general uh, you know, are addressed to say, the boundary by ribbons like this. So if they have electric charges dressed by Wilson lines, magnetic charges dressed by the, the, like the dual Wilson line part of the ribbon, dions dressed by more general ribbons, and so on. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about subalgebras. We'll be particularly interested in the algebra of physical operators associated to subregions like B. So B here, this little b, is this region I've tried to indicate by drawing this blue circle. So, and I wanted to include all the links and vertices and matter in the circle and also just even partially inside the circle. So, so even these links that are sort of half in, half out, let's include them in B. And so I want to associate to B all physical operators. So op operators that you can write down that commute with the flatness and Gauss constraint. And I want, them, <laughs> I want to associate to B the ones that act non-trivially only within B. So for example, an important kind are say ribbon operators like this. So this ribbon operator here, he's a good physical operator that's completely in little b. He say starts here and ends there and he runs along this path. Of particular importance is the center of this algebra. So this is really the part of the subalgebras that I wanna keep track of. And it, it's spanned by operators of this form. You don't really need to remember the exact form of it. I'm going to show, you, show it here and explain it for completeness. Um, but it essentially measures the total electric flux out of B. And so it's taking these, you know, it's taking these um, ribbons, these F gammas that I indicated before, and then doing a particular sum against uh, this chi is the uh, character, so chi mu is the character of the mu representation. Um, this is group element H. D mu is the dimension of the representation mu. This is the total number of group elements in G. So this gives you this operator. Uh, you can show he's a, a projector, so um, you know he annihilates uh, F mu's for mu not equal to mu prime, um, squares to one, so on. So he measures the total electric flux. And now I can tell you, we have all the ingredients. Oh, yeah, good, thank you. So uh, for this to really measure the total electric flux. Yeah, the gamma has to, be, has to run along the appropriate part of B. Yeah, I didn't, so it's not this one. So in this case, uh, it would be uh, something that say starts here and ends up there. So it, it really needs to sort of be at the at the edge of the this gamma here is um, for it to really have this interpretation that I've said here, measuring the total electric flux out of little b. It needs to be this ribbon operator or this combination of ribbon operators along the edge of little b. So we know enough for me to tell you the main result. The main result is that I claim um, we have a tensor network where you know, we have a bulk Hilbert space, a boundary Hilbert space, and a map between states in them. And they satisfy a holographic entropy formula. So the bulk Hilbert space looks like these lattices that I've been drawing. The boundary Hilbert space will look just like the set of links at the boundary, not all connected together. They're just, say, oriented like a circle. And if I took, say, the set of links overlapping this red shaded region that I'm calling capital B, and the model we construct, I can compute their von Neumann entropy using a holographic entropy formula. This is the same formula I've been writing. But now the area operator is different than before. 
it's now this particular kind of uh, well, it's this particular kind of ribbon operator. It's you know this sum of ribbons, the central ribbons that I listed in the previous slide, weighted with log d mu, d mu being the dimension of the representation. <clears throat> and so it might, for example, look like this, where you're computing the von Neumann entropy of capital B, and the say minimal ribbon is the one, uh, you know, its position because it's it's a topological operator uh, doesn't really matter except it cares what side each each matter vertex is in. So maybe in some state it's minimized by including this matter vertex but excluding that one. So it might look like that. Okay, that's essentially the main result that I want to. Uh, yeah, if there's no matter, then yeah, you can choose whichever one. If, when there's matter, uh, you're essentially minimizing over the position of the ribbon relative to each matter vertex. Oh, oh, oh. oh okay. So the minimized one is uh, is uh, only about the, the matter part. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what the, yeah. And what is the rule for the initial point? So it is, uh, for example, the bottom one to the left or to the right of the, that, that point? So by initial point, you mean here? To left or right, that does not matter. Uh, in general, you want it to be to the, le the part that's closer to the complement. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So there, uh, in my understanding, originally there was, in, in the original like area model, there's only one part that depends on the matter, and that's the entropy, the bulk entropy piece. And I was saying that both the area term and the bulk entropy, entropy piece depend on the matter inside this region? Yes. In, in fact, some more sophisticated tensor networks, still like the traditional kind, do have the area piece depend on the matter in the sense that um, you might have like regular gauge fields on the links. Yeah. Um, th this is like an ADS-CFT where matter can back react and change the area. So, the, so, you know, the minimal area surface cares about where the matter is and how it's back reacting. So it, it, even in ADSC, this is a desirable feature because we want it to care a little bit about where the matter is. Which means if it's no matter, then every time it's trivial. Right, you would always just pick the one that has nothing in it. Right. Uh, yeah, any cut works, yeah. There, there is some large n that is necessary for this formula to be valid. Yeah. Understand correctly here, you don't you didn't need any large n. Right? To get this formula to work, I will need uh, some parameter to be large, which here will show up as um, like large amounts of electric flux flowing through this guy. That's and it's that's directly analogous to having like large bond dimension in traditional tensor networks. Inequality or inequality in some limit. It's, it's an approximate equality that holds in some limit. Whoa, okay, so what, what's the limit? Yeah, we, we need this large flux limit that will become clear as I explain the construction. But essentially we need a lot of flux flowing um, uh, through this network. That's analogous in tensor networks to having a large bond dimension. If you don't have a lot of flux, then the, the effective bond dimension is very small. And then tensor networks, um, only recover a formula like this in the limit of large bond dimension. Thanks. Good. So crucial to me constructing this tensor network for you will be the fact that the physical Hilbert space doesn't care about most details of the lattice. In particular, we can, there's two things we can do to deform the lattice that don't change the physical Hilbert space at all. So we can add or remove a vertex to the pre-gauge Hilbert space, and H physical is exactly the same. So what I mean is, let's say we had a lattice, uh, a part of the lattice that looked like this. So it's maybe like five links coming into some vertex. If I were to add a link, um, and I, so I split this vertex in, into two, um, there, you know, there's a particular map that embeds this pre-gauge Hilbert space into that one. So the lattice directly corresponded to the pre-gauge Hilbert space. And the physical Hilbert space you get from both of these pre-gauge Hilbert spaces are exactly the same. And physically, you might understand this as there's no operators that can probe that change in the lattice. So for example, let's say you just had one link. Uh, you know, it has a Hilbert space HG. 
this is completely isomorphic to having two links connected at one vertex, uh, and at that vertex, you're satisfying Gauss. So there's no matter, let's say there's no matter at this vertex. So these two Hilbert spaces are isomorphic. And that's, this is the generalized statement of that. And we can also add or remove a plaquette. So this is an important additional feature that you get um, from having the flatness constraint. So what I mean, oh, I didn't mention this, so let me go back to this for a second. I, I, I stated in words that you can go from this previous Hilbert space to this one, and the physical Hilbert space is the same. What's more surprising is that you can re remove this link and you keep the physical Hilbert space the same. Um, it looks like it's a non-isometric embedding, but uh, you can check that the physical Hilbert space, it, it still maps one-to-one -one between the physical Hilbert space. Okay. And you can do the same thing by adding or removing a plaquette. So let's say we had some part of the lattice that looked like this. We can add a link like so, and the physical Hilbert space is unchanged. Now, and you can uh, furthermore, you know, there's the physical Hilbert space is the same, so the physical operators, have, you know, are one to one, and we can work out how they change under these lattice deformations. So if I had a ribbon in one, what does it look like in the other? So ribbon operators generally just stay ribbon operators. So if we had some, say, this ribbon operator here acting on these links. We could change this lattice to this one by, say, removing this link. So that's removing a plaquette. Um, and we get, so the, now the, this ribbon operator, in this case, is this one that has the same path. He just has one fewer link to act on. Is that the dimension of the group? Uh, no, this is exact. I mean, for any, yeah, I understand this for finite groups. I'm pretty sure compact groups will satisfy something similar. Yeah. You don't need the flux to be large. Right. This, this is just a statement about Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory. Yeah. And we can take these lattice modifications to the extreme. So let's say we started from this, our, our general lattice. We can actually use a series of deformations to reduce it to something almost. Uh, you know, depressingly simple. It seems to remove all of our geometric intuition about what's going on, but it's completely, you know, the, the, the physical Hilbert space for both of these lattices is exactly the same. So what, what's going on here? Well, like in this first step, I'm just removing two plaquettes. Uh, I don't remove these because they have matter in them. So that matter, if it's magnetically charged, um, the flatness constraint might not be satisfied. So I can't just for free remove it. But um, OK, we'll, we'll leave the plaquettes with matter in them alone for now. You can just contract some irrelevant vertices, contract more vertices and more, and then you just end up. Uh, and so here we're adding two more vertices to sort of separate out the plaquettes that have matter in them. So you just end up with this, this lattice that essentially has one vertex, or one, one vertex connecting all the links. All the boundary links are coming off. This is the dot, dot, dot here. So this collection here is supposed to indicate all of these boundary links with the white dots. And then this part, you know, I, we might call these lollipops because they sort of resemble lollipops. Um, this is where, where all the matter is. OK, so we can just do this full reduction. And that helps us. Circle could not be removed. Yeah, so the thing is, we're going to allow, in general, for this matter to have magnetic charge. And that's um, uh, basically the holonomy around the circle keeps track of that data. It's not, so we can't remove it for free using the moves we had before, because those moves work to, whenever there's a trivial holonomy around the plaquette. So now I can explain to you the tensor network. It's a map, say, from this lattice to this guy, so we've just gotten rid of all the interior parts. So this, this is what I'm calling the boundary Hilbert space. This is what I'm calling the bulk Hilbert space. And it has multiple steps, which I'll list for you. First, we fully reduce the lattice. So this is perhaps the main trick involved in this construction. So given this guy, we just reduce it to something that looks like this. So we have all these boundary legs and the lollipops 
It's the same physical Hilbert space, so we're allowed to do that for free. Yes. Now, assume for the moment there's no matter, and I can explain to you what the next step is. The, the rest of the tensor network is just, I put it in quotes because there's no tensors involved uh, if there's no matter. It's just the natural embedding into the pre-gauge Hilbert space. So I might draw it like this. So we're just, this drawing is supposed to indicate that we're just lifting the Gauss constraint to go from this Hilbert space to this Hilbert space. What does that mean? Well, for example, if I had two links, you know, this, this two link Hilbert space, is, it, I might as well write, described by this one ket g. Um, the natural embedding into the pre-gauge Hilbert space involves two kets that are entangled in this way. And what's important, I just wanna sketch this for you, the details aren't super important, is that this, this very simple embedding into the pre-gauge Hilbert space already satisfies a version of the, the holographic entropy formula in sort, of a, in sort of a simple way. So it's helpful in doing this argument to introduce this irret basis, which is related to this normal G basis we liked by this sum. It's like a Fourier transformation of that basis where mu labels the irrep, i and j again are like the matrix indices in that irrep. And mu here, this is, this is partly nice because mu here quantifies the electric flux flowing through that link. And so in this irrep basis, let's return to this case where we had, say, these two links, uh, but connect the, satisfying Gauss's law there. So we might as well describe the state of this two link system by this one ket mu ij. And I'm introducing here little b and little b bar that I'm going to loosely associate little b to i and little b bar to j in a way, a re for a reason that will seem clear in a moment. The embedding into the pre-gauge Hilbert space, I might write this way. Well, it works this way in the irret basis, where now we have two kets. And what's important is that they both have the same mu, which made sense because mu quantified the electric flux if we satisfy Gauss's law there, then the electric flux is measurable on either link. Uh, these two links are entangled in this, in some K index that's been introduced. I'm calling this link here on the left, capital B, and this link on the right, capital B bar. So what's important is if you look at this, you can convince yourself that given a general state psi, the entropy of capital B, say this left link, and it, it, it includes an edge mode or area piece. So edge mode is sort of a, a, a term that loosely means these degrees of freedom that we inserted whenever we acted this factorization map. So here that's associated to this degree of freedom, this index K, these degrees of freedom indexed by K. And if you computed the entropy of capital B in this state, you might write that this way, where S of little b is like some entropy associated to i, so what, what, this i index. Here, that entropy is zero, but I might have, I don't know, entangled the i and j indices in some way. That would show up here. This expectation value of an a operator is like this extra entropy you get by having inserted this entangled k pair, and formally might take this form. Now. What's important is that was the two-link case. You can generalize this with many links, the same formula holds. The area operator still cares about the net flux because that's what's measurable in both B and B bar. And so, and so if I were to have, say, take this as my bulk, have embedded it into the pre-gauged Hilbert space, then taken these three links, say, called those capital B and computed their entropy, it would be given by some formula like this, which includes, this is the important part, some term associated to like these entangled these degrees of freedom I inserted in the factorization. These are all equalities. Yeah, I will make sure to tell you where the approximations show up. And I will say in passing that this area operator quantifies the entropy of edge modes that are a little more complicated than the edge modes that were introduced in, say, the two-link factorization. There it was like, we introduced this entangled pair. It was like, 
this k index was max entangled with that k index. Now there's many links involved, so they're all just in some, when you factorize it, they're all just in some big complicated multipartite entangled state. Edge modes of turn Simon's theory kind of thing. Yeah, I'm really, yeah. So were the K's on the previous slide? Were these K's and the representation the same representation? You know, yes. Thinking of those as edge modes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, let's add matter back. How does that work? So, the general setup. Right, so remember we, we would have some reduced lattice that looks like this, and we want that, that to be our bulk Hilbert space. The bounded Hilbert space would look something like this. So it, what's important here is that we need to get rid of these lollipops. So we can't just embed this Hilbert space into its pre-gauged Hilbert space and call it a day, say that's our boundary Hilbert space, because the the pre-gauge Hilbert space for this lattice is too big. It has these lollipop factors. We need to get rid of them in a way that is conducive to getting a holographic entropy formula. That's the, the trick. And the way we do that is we act on them with, with random tensors. So we do take this bulk Hilbert space, embed it into the pre-gauge Hilbert space. So now I might draw that like this, forget about the red boxes for the moment. So there's all, <clears throat> They're all just different factors in some pre-gauge Hilbert space now. Then I get rid of all of these undesirable factors, the, one, the, the matter part, by hitting each thing in a red box independently with a random tensor. That's, that's the, the key. Now, why did we do that? Well, the reason to act random tensors is that then boundary entropies satisfy a nice formula. So this is using the technology of previous tensor networks that have been written down. And, uh, you know, for example, like I might, I sort of shifted things around to make it easier to draw. So there's some now, now there's some lollipops uh, between these. Um, but anyways, so the, the point is that if I took, say, these boundary links, these three, that intersect this red blob, the set of red blobs I've drawn, and I wanted to compute their entropy, given the boundary state, it would satisfy a formula like this same formula I've been drawing, where now the area operator is associated to this ribbon that divides all of these guys, so including some of the matter, from all the rest. So to summarize, altogether our map was this. So we started from this. Um, uh, then, uh, then each matter part will contribute, so you have a many ma matter. Yeah, this is right. You need to choose the good path such that you, mini, you minimize. Mm -hmm. right? right. So technically, so what happens at the level of this, this drawing of the lattice is that the minimization is over which of these lollipops goes with B and, is, and which of it goes with the complement. Oh, I see. And then, so, so once that's figured out at the level of this lattice, um, you can ask, what, what, is that, what does this division look like in, at the level of the original lattice before the reduction? And so you just undo all the steps that you did to reduce it here. Ribbons stay ribbons. And so it'll look like a minimization over some ribbon containing different. Uh, you know. In this case, there's the two on the top. So two things in the top. Yeah, in this example, I'm, I'm trying to draw that these two. Um, the, min the minimal ribbon is the one that includes these two in its domain. Yeah. Oh, thank you, yeah, this, this is in the limit now, yeah. So as soon as I said anything about random tensors, now it's all approximate. And this is only gonna work if there's, say, a lot of flux flowing from each of these, these guys to, out to boundary legs. That's right. Yeah, the boundary, the in plane. But the hidden So here, I think if I'm understand correctly, there's also a Hilbert space for these representations, which have to be very big. Yes. The dimension of mu is. Yes. Yes. 
but the, the, the size that were appearing before in your previous formula, the this the, those, where the where the number yeah or what are their indices? I I, I don't understand where they live or what. Okay, so each lollipop here is a combination of two links. So this link, that that link that goes in a circle, and then um, there's and then this vertex has some matter attached to it. Um, that's a particular Hilbert space, and we're picking a random state in that Hilbert space. Um, this is isomorphic to quantum double Hilbert space of the group, um, turns out. So the addition of the randomness to psi is then going to be Just integrating with the Haar measure on CPN, where that's the projectivization of the representation. Yes, it's integrating with Haar measure on CPN. Um, yeah, it's it's the Hilbert space, not of it's not HG, but I think of it as you know HG tensor HG tensor HM, where HM is the matter guy living there. Thank you. So this was this was the map. So we wanted to go from here to there, and we did it by first fully reducing the lattice. That was that doesn't require anything that we, technically that we do on the physical Hilbert space. It's just these are equivalent physical Hilbert spaces. But it's this lattice that we embed into the pre gauged Hilbert space. And then we project with random tensors on these guys. That gives us the boundary state. And I claim that this satisfies a holographic entropy formula. This is what I have been stating all along. Um, you work this out by taking the argument I put on the previous slide and unreducing it and seeing how the ribbon transforms back. Let me just quickly say, one cool byproduct of this is that you get these non-commuting areas. So let's say we have two boundary regions, this capital B, which is the red, all the links overlapping this red region, and then, I don't know, capital A, which is all the links over overlapping this gray region. So they, they intersect, they, they share some links. And then, you know, maybe the minimal, the ribbons associated to them and their holographic entropy formulas are like this blue and green ribbon. So this blue guy was, you know, the ribbon associated to capital B, this green guy is a ribbon associated to capital A. And um, to, to here I'm trying to draw the area operators associated to these two regions. And you see that they cross, they have to, if these regions overlap. And that means that um, there's not going to be a bulk state in which um, the fluctuations of both area operators are arbitrarily small. So we can't find a bulk state that's an eigenstate of both area operators. This is a desirable feature because, I don't know if I, still, oh yeah. This is a desirable match to gravity where the same thing is true because of the gravitational constraints. But other tensor networks are known to lack this property. And this was something that was pointed out by um, <clears throat> Bao, Pennington, Source, and Wall. I uh, am not going into great detail about this feature that I find very cool because I've given other talks about <clears throat> um, this feature before. I just wanted to mention that this is, this is actually one of the motivations we had for starting to think about a network like this. And I like that we get this property. So let me just conclude. We have constructed a tensor network that satisfies a holographic entropy formula with a different kind of area operator that I might suggestively call the target space area operator. And I, I believe, in my mind, this is essential if we want to combine tensor networks with a TQFT description of two plus one dimensional gravity. Maybe we don't want to do that, but if we do, we had to tackle this problem, I think. And so that's what we tried to do here. And as I briefly mentioned, this had the nice feature that there are no simultaneous eigenstates of overlapping area operators, which is like gravity and not like other tensor networks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Do we have any uh, questions? Maybe we can start with questions from prospective students. Benny? Um, is there a way you can sort of think of uh, 
like the vertices just like dual to some elementary portion of space like a tetrahedra and then you can consider each of the edges is like dual to the area of vectors piercing each face of the tetrahedra. Is it like a spin network kind of thing, or is it slightly different? Yeah, yeah. I think that our um, the bulk Hilbert space we construct here very much resembles one of these spin networks. I think that's that's the right picture to have in mind. Going would be considered like entanglement between the different. How would that manifest? It? Yeah. So I think spin, spin networks. I think you actually you essentially wind up with one of these spin networks if you take this doubly gauge model I described and you look at it in the this representation basis with these mu's and then um, so so then all of these links have to fuse correctly at each vertex and that's like these fusion rules and spin networks and that's giving you this entanglement that's essential for building up space time So could you explain again why you need that limit with the high flux uh, for that? Yes. So when you, um, right, so, so one of the subtle things in this construction was we at some point want to take this Hilbert space, which has all of these boundary links, but also all of these lollipops that have the matter. And we want to just get rid of the lollipops, but we don't want to destroy the information. We want to, you know, that, we can't just throw them away willy nilly. We have to do, get rid of them in some way that keeps the information around in the boundary state. And it turns out that um, hitting them with a random state will do the job if the, um, but you know, it needs to be a random state in a large Hilbert space. And um, you know, this is, so like if you do the calculation, it, people are pretty good at the properties of random unitaries and random states, um, but they have these nice properties usually in a large dimension um, limit. And it's, this flux is giving you this large dimension. Um, it wouldn't be enough to have, say, some large, just like some qubit there with large entropy, because, yeah, the what's important somehow is that you have this this large amount of entanglement. So the flux is giving you some like entanglement between the lollipop and the boundary that's sort of independent of the state. Um, It's like making sure that there's a lot of entanglement in this K index. Um, that's what you really need for this random tensor network to consistently map the information to the boundary. You can compare the removal of vertices where when we don't have matter related to the fact that pure gravity is just a boundary term, or are those not related? Yeah. It, it is connected to this, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, that's right. I didn't talk much about, it, it, yeah. I didn't talk much about the actual Hamiltonian in this theory. I mostly had just had these constraints and, but it is, it is the case that, right, like in gravity, the reason why the Hamiltonian changes to this boundary term is also from the constraints. So both of these statements just come from the constraints in the theory, yeah. Like, could you expand on like how you evolved the system again, like the dynamics of it? I didn't catch the time evolution part. So. so I actually don't have time evolution in this network that we ended up with. Uh, even though I started this whole thing, the first seven slides all talked about time evolution and how much I want that. Um, that was all motivation. Motivation for the technical thing we do, which is just get a tensor network with this particular kind of holographic entropy formula. Um, I think it would be interesting to try and to, to see if you could add in some sort of local duality with this tensor network. It seems like there's some curiosities still to be worked out. It's going to happen after this is satisfied, I guess. 
That's right. Yeah, I think that this, you know, this was sort of a problem we had to tackle anyway along the way, so we just went ahead and tackled it. Yeah. Um, okay, any other questions from the rest of the audience? Uh, I actually have three. <laughs> yeah. First of all, you're doing diecraft Whitney theory, which, if you look at it that way, that opens up a lot of generalizations. Great. You or anybody else have done this. First of all, adding a cosine to the block of the More generally, looking at using a fusion category. And if there's anything special with the modulus of density category. Yeah, I think that all of those are, uh, are are great ideas for future work. We have thought a little bit about it. Um, I don't know my collaborators more than I have thought about these generalizations. I don't know much about uh, all these different fusion categories, and um, so it'll take me some learning to really tackle that. The question is, could we go back to the formula for F gamma? I just don't understand it conceptually at all. One comment I would make is that it reminds me of acting with the S transformation on the on the on the one loop uh, on the torus with one puncture. If you're thinking about two dimensional G gauge theory, yeah, so I'm just wondering if you see a torus in here anywhere. Good. These kinds of conjugations of the homonyms. Yeah, I, I have not thought about the connection. Um, so you had a map, a crucial point. You had a map from HNG mod Gauss to HNG. Yes. Well, okay. So in, in general, there's no natural lift. I mean, you did write a formula, but there's no natural lift from a quotient. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Function. In other words, invariant functions are a subspace of all functions. I think that's what it is. So H sub G is the functions on G. Yeah, it's it's uh yeah L two of G we can say. And L two. It's, it's, well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's functions, of, well, yeah. G is finite. Yeah. 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 So, it would be yeah. finite. Yeah. So yeah. Functions yeah. of G is L2 of G. Yeah. But um, I see. So that's just invariant functions inside the tensor. Product of alpha. That's just invariant functions inside. Well, they're not very, then there's, there's a subspace. You just wrote it as a quotient, which I found really odd to lift a quotient. Ah. Yeah, I am imagining it in this subspace form, um, like in this two link example. I have a, yeah. I agree there's some ambiguity, and um, part of that, I imagine, yeah. For example, these lattice moves that I indicated allow me to take the same physical Hilbert space, which is this, you know, modding by Gauss, and then. Well, then at edge mode. Yeah, it, well, it, okay, the edge modes here are a little obfuscated. Easier to say exactly what I want to call an edge mode in this basis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Edge mode, I think, is a little bit. I don't know, I have a rigorous definition. Right? I completely agree. Yeah. I, I don't have a rigorous definition for edge modes for you, but um, I, on some vague level, mean these degrees of freedom we're inserting in this map. Um, I have a question with how, like, talking about how I can move the, like, the area in the, in the bulk. You're talking about how that's a desirable feature that I can move the area around. Uh -huh. That, sorry, that seems like a property of, like, an artifact of talking about the topological QFT. If I tried to do this, like, try and repeat this kind of construction in 4D, do you still want to be able to move the bulk, like, area line around? I don't know. I've, I've forgotten the name of what you were calling it, but like the bulk cut, uh, do you expect that I should be able to move that around in like D equals four when gravity is not topological or is this an artifact of, like of that you're talking about topological gravity? The conservative statement I would make is it's an artifact of the theory we get in two plus one. Um, you know, it's that that we're trying to model here. So, so yeah, in some sense, 
we can see this proposal as proposing that, I guess sensor networks have historically been thought of as a proposal that you might imagine the holographic map has some spatial structure where you're sort of like, uh, and spatial structure with regards to the gravity dis description space. But this has problems with like reconciling it with diffeomorphism invariance. On some level, this is a proposal that we still want to imagine a holographic map with some spatial structure, but now maybe it's in the space of the, the gauge theory description. And so the properties that we want to model in the gauge theory are the ones that you get from whatever, um, I don't know how to do it in three plus one. I mean, maybe it would be like loop quantum gravity, uh, but I, I wouldn't want to mess with, I'm not planning to think about that. I have a, a question. So, in, so you had this formula, right? And which, uh, and then the entropy that was counting the, the dimension of these edge modes. Yes. Uh, would suggest that if you have a line that, you know, wiggles a lot, yeah, we would have a lot of contribution to the entropy. Right? Ah. And um, you you also have the minimis. You, you, you had this object was a topological operator that should not matter whether it wiggles a lot. Right. right. Yeah, so to the Fs, um, say, like the Fs here or in the final form, like this F, um, it's measuring the, the net flux flowing uh, through, like transverse to this ribbon. So it actually, you know, it wouldn't care if it wiggled a lot on this side, as long as it's not including or excluding any new sources of flux. Um, so yeah, it's not picking up, it's insensitive to exactly how many links it's piercing. But and the matter, well, locally it changed, uh, affected the flux, so that's uh, the part you can like, move around to minimize. Yeah, like okay. a lot of, if this guy, yeah, maybe, maybe in this picture, what's going on is like this guy has uh, you know, much more flux flowing to B than its complement, and so B prefers to <clears throat> include that. Okay, any final questions or comments? If not, then let's thank Chris once again.